Good afternoon, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Redeeming the Time. I'm your host, Chris Macy. I'm the preacher with the North Valley Church of Christ up here in Cave Creek, Arizona. And you can know more about our congregation by going to www.nvcoc.net. And also while you're there, if you click on that radio mic, you can come to our blog site for this radio program where you can listen to not only this program, but all of our previous programs as well. And we want to encourage you to do that. Man, we have had a lot going on the, the past month, really. We had the, the ladies' retreat uh, went, went on in uh, September the 12th and the 13th, and they were sold out. I think they had somewhere around 120 or 140 uh, ladies there. It was quite a lot. Uh, then the, the men's retreat is coming up this weekend, and we're going to have quite a few there. And uh, in between both of those was Tackling the Text. It's an expository workshop with Guy Orbison Jr. And we only had about 37 folks able to show up for that. And I believe the reason why is that this was only the second year we've done Tackling the Text. And with the ladies' retreat previously, and then the men's retreat this coming up weekend, you know, people can't miss two weekends in a row. So next year, we, we're going to um, move Tackling the Text into October, October 22nd, 23rd, 24th of 2015. We'll be studying Romans chapters 1 through 8, and we're very confident that the, this will enable more folks to be able to come and uh, be part of that and hear some great in-depth uh, expository uh, and exegetical lessons out of uh, Romans 1 through 8 as we go through that whole section. Of course, we're splitting it in half. The book is just too long to do in one setting. So we want to encourage you to, to be part of that and come join us for that. Uh, there is also a dinner, uh, honoring dinner, coming up in October the 10th. This is a dinner that's going to honor all the folks who have worked so hard to help uh, Copper Basin Bible Camp. That's where we have the men's retreat. We have the ladies' retreat. That is also where tackling the text is, uh, is and we do family retreats up there, as well as many other activities. And it, it, uh, the thing that enables us to keep the camp going is individual hard work and so this dinner is set up so that we can honor those who've worked so hard learn some history about the camp where the camp is going and it's also an opportunity for us to be able to, to help in a monetary way the camp because it, it's again it's from individual efforts to help the camp uh, keep on keeping on and we want to uh, encourage everyone to be part of that so if you want more information on that uh, give me a call or give the congregation a call uh, here at North Valley, you can go to our website, get all that information. I don't have a guest with me here today. Uh, I should have, I could have, but I, I allowed myself to get uh, uh, caught up in too many things with tackling the text and ever, other things happening. If you didn't know, I, I also had a, a new boy uh, was born to myself and Jenny, uh, me and Jenny, and his name is Jonah. He's going to be three weeks old this Saturday, or wait a minute, yeah, three weeks old this Saturday. So. We are thankful to the Lord for, for him and that he is in good health, and so is Jenny. So since there's no guest today, I want to continue doing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm going to, we, we got halfway, a little more than halfway through chapter 6 last time. I think we got all the way down uh, through fa the fasting, and we're going to look at verses 19 to 34, uh, Lord willing, uh, today. And just, just to give us an idea of what's uh, happening and where we were at. If you remember last time in the beginning, uh, Jesus was talking about, or start off by, you know, beware of practicing your righteousness be before men. Now, the whole of chapter 6 is about having a God-centered righteousness uh, surpassing a self-centered righteousness. That is, we want to be right before God rather than being right before men. Seek the favor of God rather than seeking the favor of men. So verses 1 through 18, beware of practicing your righteousness before men. And the, and the way we give alms to the poor. And the way we pray. Do we pray before the Father? Or are we praying in a way that uh, we're trying to receive praise from men? We need to do it purely or privately, purely, properly. And we need to uh, pray purposefully. And of course, when we look at giving alms and praying, Jesus expects his disciples to do that. It's implied in the text. And then verses 16, 17, and 18, in fasting. How we fast. Now, of course, not everybody can can fast. Jesus expects his disciples to do this, but he but we know that, you know, if you're diabetic, that's something that's you really just can't do. So 
but we, we need to be aware of those things and you know, consult your doctor on that sort of thing. But when we do do it, we need to do it as for the Lord and not for men. And then we come to verses 19 to 34, this section I entitled, Trusting God and Not Trusting Self. And in here, this section fits well in that theme, God-centered righteousness versus a self-centered righteousness. And Jesus is talking about where we place our trust. We either trust ourselves, or we're going to trust God. And the area in which uh, he gives this discussion of trust is in regard to our provisions for this earthly life. You either trust yourself to provide for yourself, or you trust God to provide. So let's, well, let's see. How should we break this up? Let's um, let's look at verses 19, 19 to 22 first. But be, well, before we do that, let me give you a couple of disclaimers. Um, I think some folks sometimes we we sometimes we read the wrong conclusion in this. This is this is not a passage about um, it being a sin to be rich. God's not talking about that, and the Lord expects us to work for a living. There's other passages we can look at uh, dealing with that, and we're going to do that. But let's um, let's let's read verses 19 to 22. Well, 23. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the eye is the lamp of the body so then if your eye is clear your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So what is Jesus teaching in this text? If it's not sin to be rich, if it's, the Lord expects us to, to, uh, to work, what is he saying? I think he's telling us in this passage to make a choice. A choice between heaven and a choice between earth. You cannot serve God and mammon or wealth. You must make a choice, and he wants us to choose God by not laying up treasures on earth. He wants us to choose to trust God, to provide, by not being anxious about our earthly existence. How we make choices, decisions are made where? We make our decisions in the heart. Um, just to make this point clear, I know sometimes some folks don't understand what I mean by that. Look over, uh, keep your finger there if you're... If you're have your Bibles open. If you're driving, I'll read it to you. Matthew chapter 12 and verses 34 and 35. This is Jesus talking. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the, mouth, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. What Jesus is saying there in Matthew 12 is that it's from the heart of who we are. So it's not the literal heart. He's talking about our spirit, who we are. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanderers. These are the things that come from the heart, from who we are. This is where we make these decisions. That we may come to different conclusions in our mind but then there from there it goes to our heart our proverbial heart and it we make a decision of what to do with those conclusions and then that spiritual heart pumps it out to all our extremities and then we make that decision from the heart now the heart of man makes a choice or decision based on what fills the heart you know what is more important to me where are my loyalties? And, and things like that. And the heart decides these things. And so the heart stores two important aspects of our life. What we value most and what's most important to us. The heart also stores our loyalties. So what fills our heart determines the choices we make. Now, there in verses 22 and 23, the eye is the lamp of the body. So. The, so then if your eye, your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Uh, Jesus gives us here that key to conquering that self-serving approach to religion. And it's exemplified in a materialistic approach to life. Between two, the two statements of choice, 
choosing what you lay up and choosing what you will serve, Jesus offers a brief explanation of why we make the choices we make. Here it is. And it has to do with the eye. The body is the vehicle or the container of your life as it exists here. A lamp is a source of light and having light is essential for us to see clearly and make right choices. It is uh, as to which direction to take. Without light, we're lost, we're in darkness. The body is in danger. Just like being in a, in a room that uh, has no windows. You have the lights on, you can see the chairs, you see the tables, and you can navigate through that room just fine. The light gives us good, true information. Feeds it into our eyes, which goes into our bodies, and we make sound decisions because we can see. Turn the lights off, you're in darkness. Now you cannot see the truth of the room. You cannot see where, how to navigate and, and not hurt yourself, stump your toe, hit your knee. And so you're in danger. And you, it seems obvious to people that, well, turn the light on. But in this world, the spiritual uh, uh, world, we cannot see if we're in darkness. And yet so many are and they don't do anything about it. And when this light is given to them, they like being in the darkness because there they can do what they want. And so, Jesus gives us that key to conquering that self-serving approach with the body, the lamp, and the eye. The, the eye is the physical eye, which acts as a lamp or source of light to the body. It brings the light inside, and it is essential to our making right choices. So the eye determines whether the body or one's earthly existence is full of light or full of darkness. Light is indicates that we see things clearly, while darkness indicates that we are not seeing things clearly. Darkness hides the reality from us. Light reveals what the darkness conceals, and so light presents the truth or the reality to us. Jesus says, Jesus says that the condition of your eye determines whether your body or your earthly existence is full of light or darkness. The eye can either be healthy or it can be bad clear in the New American Standard. If the eye is healthy, we see things clearly. We see the reality of things. We have the right perspective. If the eye is bad or not healthy, then it is not bringing in the light and we cannot see clearly. That is, we cannot see the reality since it is obscured by darkness. Therefore, we do not have the right perspective on things. So the key to making right choices is to have a healthy eye to see things clearly in their true light. You know, that's the question, why did I do that? It is your eye. It is everything you choose to let into your life. So how can one see clearly? You have to turn on the light, be plugged into the word, have the wisdom of the Father. Jesus is the truth, and the truth sets us free. He is the light of the world and exposes the, the bad, the evil, the sin of this world. Now, I want us to move on to verse 25. Well, uh, let's, uh, verse 24 and 25. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. So I, we, we already hit that. I forgot. I didn't read it. I apologize. Verse 25. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the whole and the body more than clothing? Now here in verse 25. Jesus uh, says, for this reason, we should not be anxious about food, clothing, and everything else that falls under these essentials for this life here. Since we are forced into making choices, Jesus wants us to make the right choice. If you're anxious about food and you're anxious about clothing, that indicates something. It indicates what fills your heart and the condition of your eye. Anxiety over earthly things indicates an unhealthy eye and you're not seeing reality. Let's continue on, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? 
And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field, uh, how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Let's stop right there for a moment. So, you have this anxiety over earthly things, showing the unhealthy eye, and it suggests what's most important to you and that you are serving self and not God, thinking that you are in charge and therefore responsible for providing everything. The opposite of being anxious is faith, trust in the Heavenly Father. Faith is the result of a healthy eye, seeing things clearly. What Jesus wants us to see here is that our earthly existence is more than pursuing food and clothing and that the preservation of our life and body is not dependent on our own earthly pursuits. So Jesus suggests that we open our eyes and look around at the birds and the flowers in order to see things clearly. Birds do not work for food to sustain their existence. God feeds them. Flowers do not toil to make clothing to sustain their existence. God clothes them. So Jesus asks a couple of questions to open our eyes and give us light. Can you lengthen life by this fearful pursuit of accumulating things for self-preservation? The answer is no. If you could stockpile every ounce of food in the world, would this mean you would eat tomorrow? No. The Lord could take your life tonight and you'd leave behind the stockpile. Your life is dependent on more than just food. Let's say I have a piece of paper here in my hand with ink on it. It's a $10 bill. Uh, on the other hand, I have a piece of paper with ink on it. It is the Bible. What is your perspective on these things? Everyone sees money differently. Uh, it provides lunch. It makes you rich or it's nothing. Same with the world. The world sees in the, my hands the Bible and ten dollar bill and they're going to want that ten dollar bill. But if you're a person of faith you're going to know what's more valuable. Your eyes will be lit to the truth and you will want the Word of God. A second question. If God takes care of the flowers for which he has no real concern, since they are thrown into the furnace, do you think he will not take care of you? Those who have made a mad pursuit of the things of this world indicate they have little faith in God. Faith means that you trust God and not yourself for your existence. That is faith. Now, let's look at verses 33 and 34. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow, folks. If your eye is clear, you will see the reality of your earthly existence. And when you have the right perspective, we can look down upon this world from the perspective of God and not the perspective of man, it will lead you to do two things. Number one, verse 33, it will lead you to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And number two, you will not be anxious about the future. Now what is his kingdom? That is the reign of God in your life. What is righteousness? It is you being right before the Father. You're following his will. You're going to be baptized into Christ because only Jesus can truly be righteous before God since we are sinners and we, we do sin. We're going to stumble. So only Jesus is righteous before him. And if you're in Christ, 
you stand righteous before the Father. And you will not be anxious about the future. Jesus wants us to see that the only day that we have right now is today. That's it. Yesterday, that is lost to us. Everything we did yesterday is done. We cannot go back and change it. It cannot happen. All the choices, everything we've done, all the sin that has already happened, all we can do now is pray to the Father that he will forgive us. He's talking to those who are already disciples. He's talking to those who are already baptized into his name. So that's, that was yesterday. What about tomorrow? Is it guaranteed to us? No, it is not guaranteed to us. We could die right now. We could die this evening. We could die before in our sleep before we wake up in the morning and tomorrow will be lost to us. Over there in James chapter 4, let me turn, turn over there in my Bible. I want to read to you a passage. It's going to be familiar to you. You'll know this. He says, uh, James 4 verse 13, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Today and tomorrow, or the next hour even, is not promised to us. You may have heard people say, um, hey, I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. Lord willing. Because the Lord decides when we depart this world. He allows these things to happen. He is the one that has made those choices for us. And Jesus wants us to see that only the only day we have is today. He took yesterday away from us. That day no longer belongs to us. We can never live that day again. He hasn't promised to give us tomorrow. He may decide not to give it to us. So all we have is right now. And what Jesus is saying to us is this. Redeem the time. That is, make the most of your time that you have. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't fret over yesterday. Worry about right now. Are you right before the Father? Do you have the kind of faith that you can see life with the right perspective? Are you anxious about your food and your clothing if, as a disciple of Christ? You shouldn't be. The Lord will provide. Go to him in prayer. As, as I heard this past weekend from a, a good brother of mine, James Williams, wrestle with the Lord in prayer wrestle with him in the sense that being per persistent and pray to him constantly over those things that you need and if you have the right perspective in this world the things you ask of God for will be the same thing that he wants to give you you won't pray to the Lord for a, a, a Ferrari because we know that's not necessary for us but we pray that Lord that he may provide us with food clothing and shelter whatever it may be that he may give us these things so that we may live a peaceful, calm life, that we can be a light to this world, that we may preserve it as us being salt unto this world, and we can continue to sh uh, shine forth the image of his Son in our lives, that we may bring the gospel to the lost and dying world and bring them in a right relationship with the Father by baptizing them into Christ. Have we made those kind of decisions? Chapter 6 is a great chapter. It's a chapter about us uh, uh, not serving ourselves, but serving God. Not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in the Lord. A God-centered righteousness that surpasses a self-centered righteousness. Because that's the kind of righteousness we need. Not the righteous, righteousness that we see in the scribes in the Pharisees. It needs to surpass that. And then as he gets here into chapter 7, which is going to be the last part, of the Sermon on the Mount, it's a truth-seeking righteousness surpasses a pretentious righteousness. And in here, Jesus shows us that a, that truth uh, righteousness does indeed surpass that pretentious. And what I mean by that is, 
uh, uh, scribes and Pharisees had a religion of pretense. They made grandiose claims that they could not back up with action or evidence. They were also hypocritical or two-faced. A religion of pretense or pretentious righteousness is one that is not based on truth and does not seek truth. As we will see at the end of chapter 7, the only true and sustaining religion is built on the rock-solid foundation of the teachings of Christ. All other approaches to religion are only pretense, by comparison, and are built upon the shifting sand of human doctrine. And we'll break up that chapter into six sections when we get into that next time. But that'll be next time, folks. So I encourage you to, to read the Sermon on the Mount again. Read chapters 5, 6, and 7. Think on these things. Look to see what is it that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. These are things that are good for us today and let us take on that same image as our father and our son or, uh, his son well thank you again for being with me uh, this uh, afternoon i hope your day is going well i pray that you are all seeking the truth and reading your bibles and wanting to be know more about christ and let us always remember that tomorrow is uh, or, or yesterday was lost to us tomorrow is not promised to us we just have today so let us redeem the time.